Today I have something that is still currently a work in progress, but I will do a little brief showcase anyways. So recently I began work on a new Redstone computer, and what this new computer has that uh, my other Redstone computers didn't have is that this computer um, relies on analog uh, logic instead of say binary logic. Now what you see here is some of the hardware or some of the main components that I am going to be using in my new computer. Now specifically this analog computer hardware uses the base 16 counting system or hexadecimal as some people like to call it. Now hopefully I'm just going to go uh, through all three of these um, components one by one, and uh, likely this is not all of the stuff that I'm going to be using in my new redstone computer, however, um, I am currently keeping most of the information on my new uh, redstone hex computer uh, under wraps. So I'm not really going to be releasing a lot of information on this new computer project up until I do a big showcase and a big reveal of this computer's functionality and what it looks like and all of its um, interesting little quirks and specs. So yeah, um, hopefully I'll do my best to try and explain how all three of these uh, main components work. And without a further ado, let's get right into this showcase. So the first component we're going to be looking at is the driving force behind my uh, Redstone Hex computer. Now this is uh, the computer's CPU. The total dimensions of this CPU is 13 by 6 by 15, if I remember that correctly. And it has five functions. Three functions are for controlling the uh, registers, the, you know, the general purpose data registers, and the other two functions are for controlling the ALU. So yeah, over here we have a naked copy of the CPU so that we can actually get a better look at all these parts. So over here we have the decoder which is supposed to take in opcodes and decode them into separate output lines which of course go to all of the different computer comp uh, the different CPU components. And actually what this decoder is, is, that, is it's actually uh, split into two different sections. And the reason why this decoder is actually split into two sections is because so I could have an easier time um, trying to identify where or what all the opcodes um, did which function. So <clears throat> uh, this top section over here actually uh, controls the ALU and the output register as this bottom section over here controls the A and B registers. So looking over at this uh, main side panel over here we have all of the I.O. ports for all the different parts of the CPU. And so uh, this first port down here is for taking in and taking out data or taking in and receiving data from the main uh, bus, from the main data bus. And over here, this port is for the opcodes. So this is an opcode input, which just gets routed all the way to the decoder. And this output over here is the opcode overflow. So if the signal strength or the value is greater than five on this line, then it will activate this, um, well, you're probably going to see it better here, but uh, it will activate uh, this little buffer here, 
and it will send an output through this opcode overflow. And of course you can uh, take this uh, port and you can route it to all the different, like a different uh, computer part, or you could send it to another CPU or something for, I don't know, maybe like a, a dual core computer or something. I don't really know, but that's just something you could probably do with that. Looking over here, we have the conditions. Now, I think I forgot to mention, but this CPU is actually Turing complete. It's got, I mean, it can't really, conf it can't really perform uh, conditions on its own, but it can detect if certain things are certain things inside the CPU, and it can send that uh, signal to the, say, the RAM and then the RAM will know what to do with um, that condition. If, say if the C register is zero, um, because it is zero right now, um, the uh, zero flag right here is showing a zero. So it will send that to the RAM and then the RAM will um, know what to do. It, will, it can jump to different uh, address locations or whatever and this second condition here is if the C register is not zero. But currently it is zero, so this is turned off. All right, so now before uh, we move on to the other components, I would like to give a little demonstration on this CPU in action. So because we don't have anything really hooked up to this, we don't got any uh, RAM or any control logic or anything really uh, we're just gonna have to input everything uh, all the instructions manually and what I want to demonstrate is uh, this CPU running the Fibonacci sequence and to uh, run the Fibonacci sequence on the CPU first off we're going to have to uh, write one to the data bus <clears throat> and then we're gonna have to update the a register and as you see that gets saved into the a register and we're gonna deactivate that and now we're going to enable the ALU uh, sum command so I think that is number two so we're gonna select number two and as you see the output is reading a uh, it's reading one so that is the uh, first value that is outputted as one um, <clears throat> so now uh, we're going to save um, the output of the C register to the B register. So we're going to write to the B register and then we're going to add again. Now I believe, oh, oops, now I believe it's actually reading a 2 now. So that's 2. So now we're going to update the A register again. And then we're going to add A and B together. And that should give us a three. And we're gonna keep repeating this. Uh, we're gonna actually save it to B now. Save it to B. We're gonna add. And now it's going to output, God damn it, it's gonna output five. If we keep doing this, it's going to go through the entire Fibonacci sequence, um, at least a uh, 4-bit Fibonacci, since uh, this is this um, CPU can only support a uh, uh, something equivalent to a 4-bit computer. So we have five. Uh, we're going to now going to write that to the A register if I'm correct and we're going to add that together and we should have eight yep we got eight and the last number which is 13 um, we're just going to 
do that again. We're going to input the same, same commands, and it now has 13. So moving on to the next component here, we have uh, the RAM. So this is a RAM design that I came up with alongside uh, my CPU. And what this single RAM chip right here can do is it's actually capable of storing up to four bytes of data. And while it doesn't really look like it can store four bytes because it's so small, but the reason why I say this is because each hexadecimal bit is equivalent to uh, four binary bits or a um, or a nibble and two of these um, bits together represents or is actually a single um, a single address location in uh, this RAM <clears throat> so two of these together uh, combined is actually a full byte and because we have four of these uh, stacked together horizontally that is um, that is a total of four bytes so over here we have a naked copy of um, my RAM design so that way we can actually get a better look of how everything works uh, and maybe a better look of all the parts and so these registers here are actually vertical are just vertical versions of the uh, CPU registers here <clears throat> so and these golden uh, lines here well these ones here are for uh, writing and these lines here are for reading <clears throat> So say if we want to save a certain set of numbers into a certain location, we just uh, select which um, memory location to uh, write to. So we want to write to a 2, we just enable this line and it will get saved into this location here. And if we want to read that, we just enable this line and it will get read out uh, through this output right here. So to give a quick demonstration on this RAM in action, I actually have a single uh, location here and we have these input lines right here. Uh, actually before we uh, use this we're gonna enable the clear function so it's just gonna wipe all the current data stored in this location out. So now if we want to write a new set of values, we're just going to say we want to write 3 and we want to write 6 or maybe we could write 5. So we write that, we can enable the write command and it will get written into these memory cells. So that's 5 and that's 3. And now if we want to read that out, we just enable this, and it gets read out. So last but not least, we have this um, analog sender slash uh, receiver system. And actually this uh, design is um, loosely based off of uh, CT5K's FDAR FDAT system, which is made for the same purpose, which is taking in hex values, uh, turning them into pulse length or a pulse, and um, turning that pulse into hex, uh, a hex value again. And how this works is you input a hex value into this input and uh, this transmitter will turn that hex value into a pulse. And this pulse can last um, a certain amount of time depending on the type of number that you input. Say if you input a bigger number, then it will output a longer pulse. You input a, a smaller number and, the, uh, and it will output a 
a shorter pulse, a pulse that lasts a shorter amount of time. So now to quickly demonstrate this, I'm just going to send a few numbers uh, through the system. So we can send a start by sending a 5. So it's going to read a 5 from the output. And we can also send another number. Let's do 3. 3 is there. We can do, let's say, we'll just do 10, <clears throat> I guess, and then 15. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the showcase. Um, I'll probably go a bit more in depth on how all these parts work and uh, some of the other parts that I didn't feature in this video that will also go uh, with my computer. Uh, once I finish my uh, Redstone computer project and do the big reveal, I'll probably uh, go a bit more in depth on that. Anyways, thank you guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next video.